introduce to you Jason Hughes. Uh, he is with the Ohio Suicide, Suicide Prevention Foundation, uh, which is such an important organization in the state. Um, I've got a little uh, bio here on you. Let me read a couple things, Jason, um, that I thought were very interesting. Uh, to begin with, you are the program manager for Temporary Assisted to Needy Families, the TANF program, to help supply suicide prevention programming to youth who are served by the programs that work with socioeconomically disadvantaged children. Um, gosh, that's, that's such a, a wonderful program. Um, you serve as a program manager and veterans liaison for an AmeriCorps grant, and this promotes mental health first aid training to help lower veteran suicide rates, to bring awareness to mental health care, develop partnerships with the community, and support the veteran, veterans' objectives of the Ohio Governor's Challenge. You are retired from the United States Army. Thank you for your service in 2019. And you are a certified mental health first aid and working minds instructor. Uh, so with that introduction, please go ahead and start. Jason, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And pull these slides up. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. well, for, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present. Uh, this is a great opportunity, and my the Executive Director, Timothy Cody of the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation, also wants to thank you for allowing me to present today. So here is the name of my presentation. The uh, central focus is the Citizen Soldier, which is a National Guard service member. Here's some additional background of me. Uh, you know, I did serve in the United States Army for 22 years, both active duty and, and the Guard. Uh, some of the things that I did was I deployed for Operation Noble Eagle, which is uh, directly right after 9-11. Uh, I was a master resilience trainer. I was a suicide intervention officer, and I was also a sexual assault response coordinator. Uh, my background in the actual military is uh, I wore those fancy suits that you see on your left. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm uh, kind of used to wearing a mask. That's what I did in the military. And then we'd already talked about the actual certifications. Uh, that I have. It's a little different than uh, what we picture when we talk about the military. We think of just the standard uniform with, with a weapon, but the dynamics of the military, as you can see, they're, they're a lot different than what people realize. All right, so the focus, the citizen soldier. Here's the best definition that I can find to sum that up. It's National Guard, the Reserves, the Reserves Officer Training Corps, or, or as you know, ROTC. Uh, this is that mission right there. Um, back in 2007, the rock band um, Three Doors Down, they partnered with the National Guard and they released a video called Citizen Soldier. Now, all the lyrics of that song are great. It's the actual visual aspect of, of that video uh, song that they wanted to promote. And it basically illustrated what the National Guard was capable of doing. Uh, when called, we respond with ready units. So they would show images of like the fires out in California, and it'd be like, I was there during the fires. Uh, like hurricane season, I responded to that. So it was a great presentation. Now, having said that, I want to make sure everyone understands that this is not a campaign for you to join the National Guard or the military or anything. Uh, I just wanted to present this information to kind of illustrate some of the things that occur uh, of, with our service members in regards to anxiety, stress, and suicide ideations, which we'll get to later in the presentation. So let me just say that again, this is not a recruiting campaign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the scenario. So imagine it's Friday evening, you, know, you just finished a 40 hour work week, with multiple Zooms, we know that we do virtual platforms for everything, because this is what we're doing today. Had a bunch of deadlines and an ongoing changing environment of the coronavirus, which we know is pretty much the, the number one focus for everything. The standard person would be thinking about, hey, this weekend I'm going to do some extra extracurricular activities. Or I'm going to do something out in the yard. Uh, I'm going to do something with my family. However, a National Guard service member, they have duty this weekend, which we call a multiple unit training assembly or a MUTA. What that basically means is Saturday and Sunday, they're going to work anywhere from 8 to 12 hours supporting the mission. 
Now, that's not where it st stops, though. First thing in the morning, Army Physical Fitness Test. Those members are required to do as many push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run, and this is the graded event. Now, why is that important? These things impact unit readiness. What that means is it impacts promotions. What's their career going to look like? They're required to pass one Army Physical Fitness Test per year. The stress of I've got to pass this event can be overwhelming for some soldiers, which is why we want to make sure that we're working with them to ensure that they are fit to pass that test. The next event is Army training. Now, for this scenario, we're going to use the Homeland Response Force mission. Uh, big, long acronym right there. That's my background, the Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear mission. Basically, what that means is this is a simulated event as if a chemical or biological or radiological event happens here in the United States, and this unit responds and performs consequences management. In other words, this happens. Now we have to mitigate and begin recovery uh, operations. Uh, I was actually a part of this mission for seven years, and the Homeland Response Force mission is, is really dynamic. Uh, some of our uh, Ohio Army National Guard service members uh, supported the, uh, the inauguration. So this goes to show there's a lot of stresses that are introduced to them that's required for our service members. Another unique thing about this mission is every 18 months, it is actually evaluated. So all the tasks that they perform is a pass or fail standard, and they're required to pass to sustain operations. So they have this ongoing stress of every 18 months, we're gonna be evaluated on these tasks. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and it can be very challenging. Uh, oh. and, and each service member has their own unique mission. And, and that is actually what's fun about it is, is seeing how everything kind of comes together for the overall picture. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it doesn't stop there. Now we're being briefed on a potential deployment. Now, when I say that, this does not mean that our Army National Guard is being deployed. This is just the potential scenario that can be introduced to our, our service members. And as you can see with the sticky note I added there, the average deployment is anywhere from six to 12 months. Now, each branch of service is different. And when I say by that is, the Army has a tendency to have deployments that last longer because they have higher numbers. There's more people in, in the Army in comparison to other branches of services. The Air Force does deploy for anywhere from five to eight months, but they also have a different mission. And then obviously the Navy and the Marines are deploying as well. Later in the uh, the slides, we're going to talk about the stigma that surrounds service members that do deploy and service members that do not deploy. So please remember that service members that do deploy versus who do not deploy. That's not where it stops though. Why they're performing their mission, focusing on what they've got to do while in the uniform, the stress and anxiety there of their home life, it doesn't stop or slow down. So you just found out this information and now you're thinking, wow, I can't believe this. I'm going to miss Sarah's musical again. And I hope she understands why I can't be there. We could pretty much plug whatever scenario we want in there. It could be, wow, now I'm going to miss Johnny's uh, graduation at Ohio University. That's a significant event. Mm -hmm. These are just some of the things that a service member has to compartmentalize while they're on duty. Now, I underline this sentence because I want to make sure everyone understands. This is a volunteer military. So when they raise their right hand, these are things that they understand that comes along with the job. We know that is part of the mission. However, that does not mean that they are not impacted by mental health side effects. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about mental health, I'm going to give some interesting stats on how that works. The CDC reports that, an America, that Americans, one in five Americans, will have a mental illness during the course of their life. Now, I wanna make sure you understand that these are temporary. That doesn't mean it's long-term, but during someone's life, one in five Americans will have a mental health illness. And can also, one in 25 will have a serious mental illness. What I mean by serious mental illness, we're talking schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Of those impacted by uh, mental illness, the National Council for Braver Health, which is responsible for facilitating uh, mass, the uh, uh, mental health first aid training that um, Mary talked about at the beginning, 
they say 41% of people with a mental health actually seek mental health services on any given year. So all of all of those people, only 41% are actually seeking medical or and professional help. Hmm. And we'll talk about that later when we get to some stats. So because of Operation Enduring Freedom, which is Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom, or OIF, we have lots of cases of TBI, which is traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, PTSD is a, is a term that we hear, often hear a lot. The TBI, we don't always hear about. TBI is a big thing because of OEF and OIF because of improvised explosive devices. In other words, explosions that occur around our service members and that shock of the impact that it actually does uh, to the brain. Mm. And as you can see at the top left, the stats uh, of the um, veterans that are reported of having PTSD, 11 to 20 percent of them are, in fact, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Mm. Now, we do know that there are other conflicts that have occurred over the last 50 to 60 years. And later in those slides, we'll talk about those. But Operation Enduring Freedom, which is Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom, those are the ones that we're looking at right now. And it's 11 to 20 percent are impacted by post-traumatic stress disorder. So how does the National Guard uh, approach suicide prevention training? They use the ACE model, which is Ask, Care, Escort Training Model. What that means to ask, asking the question, the most difficult question someone's going to ask. And when they ask this question, they are direct. Are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. I was direct in that question. Notice I didn't say, hey, um, I recognize there's some things going on, but you're acting kind of different. You don't have to ask, answer this question if you don't want to. You really don't. If you're uncomfortable, don't. But are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. That is not direct. Ask the direct question. Are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. Care. They've responded to you. They've given you that answer. Now we're taking care of them. Escort getting them to professional help. This is the equivalent of CPR. If you've been through CPR training, they teach you how do I take care of someone until professional medical arrive on the scene. This is what the, the, the ACE or the ASK model is uh, framed around. And I, I was lucky enough to actually facilitate this training for 12 years while I served in the military. I do believe it is an excellent tool, especially when it is combined with the Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training, which is the ASSIST model. Now, mental health first aid training has also been included in that, and, in, and it is great. Why is this important, though? We've got to remember, 41% of people with a mental illness actually seek mental health professionals and why is that what's the stigma of what's the sign of weakness if i tell someone that i'm having mental health issues maybe i won't get promoted or it might be the end of my career or it's a sign of weakness we've got to eliminate that stigma because 41 percent for me as someone who works in mental health is not a number i want to settle for i want it to be a hundred percent that means a hundred percent of service members and non-military service members that are experiencing mental health uh, illnesses are seeking professional help. Uh, this is a unique uh, event because of COVID-19. This uh, happened in July that our um, this was the first time that these branches of services combined for a mission. So we have representation of the Ohio Army National Guard the Navy Reserve, the Ohio Air National Guard, which is the Air Force, and the, the Ohio Militia. A uh, great quote that the uh, was from the Air Force officer is, you don't always have to pick up a rifle. You could put, you could push a shopping cart to improve someone's life. And this just demonstrates the uniqueness of our veterans and military service members of what they do when a crisis happens. Because they realize that just because COVID's going on doesn't mean that they're not impacted in their family life. However, the mission requirements is they still have to respond for these events to support the mission of the state and the governor's office. So these are some of the interesting dynamics that's occurring with our veterans and uh, military service members. Now, there is a difference when I say veteran and, and service members. Uh, 
when we say veterans, it can be service members currently serving or those who have left military service. Obviously, current military service members would be National Guard members, uh, which support state level of, um, missions. Reserve, they support federal, and then active duty obviously supports the national. Uh, all three, uh, National Guard, Reserve, and active duty do deploy overseas. It's not just one of them. All three do deploy. In fact, a lot of the deployments we know have been supported by National Guard and Reserve units, specifically in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I will say I will give you a warning. The uh, the next slide, and I actually removed one of those slides, so it's only one slide. I do have data uh, it is, is accurate data reported by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. So if, if you're not comfortable with this information, I ask that maybe you take a break for maybe the next two or three minutes so we don't have to, to see this information. But I think it's important to present real data so we can sh demonstrate how our veterans are impacted with the mission and just stress in general. So this is the 2018 data. Now you might be asking yourself, why are we looking at 2018 data when it's 2021? Well, the VA reports on a two year cycle. So in the spring of 2021, we will be looking at the veteran suicide data of 2019. So on a two year cycle. So spring of 2019 date to be determined is when we'll be looking at, at uh, the 2019 data. I'm sorry, spring of 21, we'll look at 2019 data. So 211, 211 veterans uh, died by suicide. Now it's important that what I just said, died by suicide. Let's talk about language. Language is important when we talk about suicide. This is already a very sensitive topic. We want to make sure that when we talk about it, we're framing it correctly. Um, a lot of times when we're having conversations, maybe even watching a movie or listening to someone talk about an event, they say, such and such committed suicide. We want to update that language. This is language that used to be accepted. However, now uh, mental health providers recommend that we don't use this word. Instead, we say died by suicide. When we think of the word commit, like you commit to Ohio University, you commit to meeting up with friends after work to have a good time. Mm -hmm. You commit to losing weight in the next 30 days. We don't want to commit to causing bodily harm that could be a, a permanent situation. So we want to update that language and we use the word die by suicide instead That's of saying tough. he or she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, good point. And, and it is. And this is a hard thing to change. Uh, I work in this field and I catch myself saying it sometimes because we used to use it a lot. So it's kind of hard to break that habit. But I make sure I always want to bring that up because once you, you change that language, you notice how many times you actually hear other people say it because it's in our reticular activating system. In other words, we're looking for it. So these numbers are staggering right there. You notice that they're just kind of all over the board. Um, 29 in the 18 to 34, 53, 35 to 54 range, and then 85 in hmm. the 55 to 74 range. Now we're going to take those numbers and I added some age perspectives to kind of give a snapshot of what we're talking about. So when we talk about the 55 to 74, obviously that could be starting at the Vietnam War level and then working all the way through that list. Uh, when we're talking about 35 to 54, that's not that Vietnam War. That could be the Gulf War, which was Desert Storm the, fir the first time we went. Uh, and then we look at the 18 to 34, that's predominantly uh, focused on the uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out in uh, the Somali civil, civil War involvement, that would be in the 35 to 54. A good comparison of what that, that conflict is, is if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, that's what they're referring to right there. Mm -hmm. So remember, when we're talking about suicide data, changing that language and making sure that we're, we, we're not um, – using the language that we used to do. Now, earlier I talked about deployments. And remember I said, we're gonna address the stigma and the stereotypes about that. There is a misconception that our veterans uh, that are experiencing mental health issues and die by suicide 
are only veterans that deployed in combat operations. We know from data that we're receiving from the VA that is not accurate. In fact, there recently has been a spike where there are more numbers of service members that deploy that never deployed to a combat environment. They never deployed, have experienced mental health illnesses, and they have died by suicide. So the stigma of only combat operations veterans are the ones that we should be focused on, that is obsolete. That is not the case of the data that we're seeing. Now, it is not reflected in this. I, I did not want to present information where it gets too detail-oriented. I wanted to kind of give you a, a big snapshot of what that looks like. But I would just I would just remember that it's not only those who are deployed to a combat environment that we should be paying attention to. It's those who are just haven't deployed at all. Now, what are some reasons for that? Well, there could there, there can be multiple reasons. It could be, you know, I didn't. I'm, That's just sorry. what I'm going to ask you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. But I was No, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Well, it was just that. Some of the reasons for that. And there, there could be several reasons. It could be, you know, I, I joined the military because I wanted to serve my country and I wanted to, you know, potentially go to whatever deployment uh, was was asked. And, you know, they didn't get to do that, depending on what unit they, they, they were involved with. Because each type of job, you know, they have their own mission. Not all units are deploying to combat environments. So it's all about what the mission requirements are. Uh, and it just, and it, or it could be just, you know, they've got something going on in their home life. Because remember, we talked about earlier, just because they're on duty does not mean the dynamics of their home life stop. They continue on. Uh, if you're a male service member and you're married and you have kids, your your wife and children, their lives continue. If you're a female service member and you're married, it could be your husband's at home with the kids and that life continues. So it's the juggle of the two while still trying to main focus on both. Mm -hmm. And we, and that can be difficult because, as we know, that not everybody compartmentalizes uh, stress the same way. And what I mean by that is, if you look at it in a resiliency way, there could be someone that, you know, when uh, they're faced a stressful situation, they're fine, they're comfortable with it. But it could be something like they're watching sports and they completely lose control of their emotions. Now, isn't it interesting that they can watch sports? not control their emotions, but then they can watch, they can be in a stressful real world environment and they're fine. It is just a good demonstration that not everybody compartmentalizes stress the same way. Here's what's important. That's okay. It is okay for you not to handle stress the way someone else does because your story and your life dynamics are different from someone else. So I wanna make sure everyone understands that, okay? Please not, do not fall into the trap of comparing how you handle stress with someone else because that's not your life. That's theirs. And just like, so it's okay for you to handle stress a little different. But at the same time, you've got to be cognizant of that and not look at someone and say, hey, why is this a big deal for you? It's not for me. Well, you're not them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that answer your question? It does. Yes, most certainly. Uh -huh. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Okay, so how can we help? So here, here, here's the uh, the mission statement for Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation. But then I'm going to go into it, a story, a unique way that we can approach this. So as you can see, I underlined identify the warning signs of suicide. Uh, some warning signs would be um, you're around someone who is known as a big talker. They talked a lot. They're always like, we had a great week. We did this. Now all of a sudden, they don't say as much. They don't seem as, as, as happy. Uh, they're a little, little distant. Or um, all of a sudden they're giving away personal possessions. Hey, you know, I, I love collecting comic books, but I don't need these anymore. Change of behavior, a dramatic change. Uh, confidence to ask about thoughts of suicide. Remember I talked about the direct question. Confidence to ask the direct question. I recognize you being different here lately, and I care about you. Are you thinking about suicide? Or are you thinking about hurting yourself? I'm asking the direct question. Here's what I'm not doing though. I'm not saying, well, you know what? I'm glad that you shared that with me. Let's go get some help so we can get you fixed. I would be cognizant about using the word fixed, okay? Mm -hmm. 
We're talking about human lives. You fix your car or you fix a watch that's no longer working. We don't we don't fix people. Uh, they're not material. So you can change the language, you know, whatever works for you. But I always like to say, hey, let's go get help together uh, because, you know, you deserve some help. And you and what I'm doing is I'm conveying that you are part of the process. It's not just me. You are part of the, this is your journey. And people like to be empowered. When I empower you, it makes you feel, well, you know what? Maybe I'm not alone that this person really does believe in me and I'm part of the process. So empowerment is, is good in that process. And then the, the, teaching them the, the ability to refer to mental health providers and, and, and specifically specializing in military culture. Obviously that's important because if we don't understand the dynamics of veterans and service members, sometimes it's kind of hard to frame the conversation because we don't speak the terminology. Now, Another part of my job that wasn't on my uh, bio is I do work with first responders. I am also a first responder liaison. However, I was never a first responder. So when I am working with first responders, sometimes they'll say stuff and I'm like, Ugh, I don't really fully understand that. So I have to ask a question. That's important because if I'm going to help first responders, I got to realize that I may not understand some of that terminology and that is important for me to understand that. That's why we recommend with veterans that we make sure that they're seeking mental health care from those who specialize it because they understand the terminology and the dynamics of the service member. So, Jason, we had a uh, comment mm -hmm. uh, in the chat and I'll just tell you this real quick. Uh, we had someone say that in a class, their professor talked about asking what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. <clears throat> so that's somewhat similar to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, that's uh, the professor. It was great how he, he or she framed that is mm -hmm. they allowed them to tell their story. And not what's wrong with you? Because when we say things like what's wrong with you, it's it comes across very, very mean. So it's like, what? why are you acting this way? And, and that individual might get defensive and be like, hey, like this is my feelings we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that is a great example that they, they did. It's just allowing them to um, tell their story. Another comparison to that is when we're having a conversation, I'd be cognizant of using why questions. Why did you do that? Why did you go through that door? Uh, why did you wear that shirt? When we ask why questions, sometimes it comes across as defensive mm -hmm. and it's intrusive. I would recommend is how did you do that? Um, how did you come to that conclusion? And uh, um, how did we get to this point? And it's so it's opening the conversation of empowerment and it's not so, you know, what you did ain't working and I don't believe in it. <laughs> does that right. make sense? Right, it sure does, yes. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer the uh, the comment for the? I believe so. Uh huh. So um, so here is a creative way to talk about how we can help. And you, some of you may have heard the upstream example. What we do in suicide prevention is we try to approach these situations from an upstream mentality. So I'll tell a quick story to kind of illustrate what that means. So there's this village that's uh you know it's out in the country and it's beautiful out there and there's this great beautiful stream that everyone always goes to a lot the problem is it actually leads to a waterfall that is very dangerous it's very dangerous we know that if anyone would happen to go over that waterfall it would not be good for them so one day elizabeth an older lady is you know walking by the, the, the waterfront and just like she does every day because she enjoys the outdoors and she hears someone screaming when she looks out and there's a man in the water and he's heading towards the waterfall. So she jumps in the water and she goes out there and she saves him and he's like, oh, thank, thank you, thank you. I was afraid I was about to go over the waterfall. Before she can respond, she hears someone else yelling. So she quickly moves him to the, the land and she goes, she saves another person. Again, thank you, thank you. I thought I was gonna fall over the waterfall. She gets him to the shore and she thinks, wow, this is this is pretty serious. So she briefed the village. Hey, we've got this waterfall. I mean, the scenery out there is great, but we've got to address what's happening with these people going over this waterfall. Let's figure out how we can fix this. So the village, they get together and they think, all right, let's 
add these guard towers by the waterfall and we'll take turns rotating down there to make sure that no one's in trouble and we can save people. They put the plan in place, it works, they save people, they don't save everyone, but they are saving a lot of people from going over the waterfall. Well, one day, this same woman is thinking, I don't know about this. I'm not sure this plan is effective. So she just starts walking upstream. The villagers, they freak out. They're like, what are we doing? Where are you going? We need you here to keep people from going over this waterfall. And she says, I recognize that. However, I don't believe this plan is effective long term. So I'm going to move upstream to figure out a way I can mitigate this at an earlier state before it gets to the point where they're down by the waterfall. And that's what the upstream theory is. In other words, we're having conversations with people that are showing warning signs or risk factors at their earliest state. We're not waiting to the point where it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to leave this person alone because I'm afraid they may do something. Uh, upstream mentality is identifying the um, the um, I can't think of the, I lost my word. Um, the symptoms at their earliest state. So that's why we always recommend the upstream. And all the gatekeeper training that we give, uh, mental health first aid, working mind, source of strength, we always recommend um, this method. Okay. Here's some of the resources that the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation, when we're talking about veterans that can provide uh, we talked about that earlier, Mental Health First Aid, eight-hour course. It's just one day. Uh, it's a great course. Uh, Austin Lucas and myself and Mary Wolf were certified in this training. There's an additional um, requirement that we take where it's specifically geared towards veterans. So they change about 25 slides that's more focused on the veterans. Star Behavioral Health Providers, this is specifically for healthcare providers. And then the Together Strong app, that is sponsored by Cognito. It is a virtual presentation uh, that you basically download on your phone and you complete that training. And it basically says, hey, you responded this way. Probably not the best way. Let's try a different way to respond to that. Some of the other training that's not listed on this screen, QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer, and Working Minds. Source of Strength. The reason why source of strength is not up there, source of strength is more focused on the upstream mentality. However, it is geared towards youth, middle school, and high school level students, which obviously would be before military service. Mm -hmm. Just grab another drink of water. All right, some additional resources. We have um, obviously the Ohio Army National Guard, Department of Veterans Affairs, and Ohio Cares. Ohio Cares is a great resource. There's a veteran self-check quiz on there. Basically, service members log in, take this quiz. Based on the results of how they answer, it says you probably, we recommend that you seek uh, professional help with these resources. It's And it's it's great how they frame it too. I've gone in there and, and, and changed the answers around to see how they uh, respond based on the answers. And uh, even when, you know, I tried to make it uh, the most extreme, the way the system is set up, it's great. And it, it doesn't catastrophize people making it sound like this is the worst case scenario. It basically facilitates them on how to reach out to mental health services. <laughs> Underneath my picture there, you notice we have the National Crisis Line, uh, the 1-800-273-8255. The, the veterans can press one, and they go on to Veteran Crisis. Um, the 8255, that's the word talk on your phone. Uh, this is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year services. It is transferred to 164 crisis counselors in 49 states. So there's a lot of resources that are tied to the National Suicide Prevention Line. Um, I know the big talk now is 988 that's coming out. However, because that system is in its earliest stages, we won't we won't talk about that. But if you're interested in 988, I'd recommend you look that up, especially for the state of Ohio. That could be a it, it's it's coming. We just don't know when it's going to be official. It's basically going to be the new. Um, crisis line that we can use here in Ohio. 
So here's my contact information. Again, I work at Ohio State Heart Prevention Foundation, the program manager and veteran liaison. There is my number. We are working uh, predominantly remotely, so that's actually my uh, office number, but I do check my voicemail every day. There's my email address. Um, very passionate about what I do, especially given that I served in the military for 22 years. When I left the military, I was concerned that I was not going to be able to continue working with service members because I loved my job. Coming to OSPF was, was a blessing because not only do I get to work with service members, I'm now in a position where I work with the governor's challenge team where I can help push policy and you know take care of our brave men and women who serve this country. Are there any questions for me? Let's see. I think we may have a question. Kara just wanted you to know that she definitely learned a lot from this presentation and she thanks you. Um, you know, I might add too, Jason, that uh, I've done quite a few different things with the university and I used to actually work with our student veterans. And it honestly was one of the, I, I was just so glad and honored to be able to do that. And I did that before we actually had a veteran in place to do it, which is ideal, you know, that's what we need. But um, just in getting to know our students and to work with them and to understand some of the things they're going through and how it's affecting them, you know, in their school life. Um, and not only that, you, you, you learned how it was affecting them in their home life and, and their entire life. But I just thoroughly enjoyed um, being able to do that and was honored to do that and work with our uh, veterans programs each year. So we do have a veterans liaison uh, now. Her name is Teresa, Dr. Teresa McKenzie, and she is Air Force <laughs> and uh, she's on our campus and, you know, just does a wonderful job working with our veterans now. So um, that's just, um, you know, and I think the older I've gotten and the more that's going on in the world, you just develop so much more of an um, appreciation and admiration for our military. Uh, sometimes you don't think about that as much when you're younger, uh, but I think about everything, you know, that we've been going through and what's been going on in our country and um, just how much we rely and depend on our military for so many different things. So we do need to be very appreciative and thankful of that. And then, you know, with the topic here at hand, um, suicide and suicide prevention and mental health. Gosh, you know, you couldn't have a, a more important topic. And uh, again, I think in, in the times that we're in right now too, so um, I really appreciate tremendously you doing this. Um, I, I might add too that I did go through the mental health first aid training. Uh, now I think mine has lapsed. I, I don't think I have completed like there's an ongoing every year, isn't there? Yeah, there's, they, they keep introducing uh, follow up training to keep make sure that the training is up to date. <laughs> right. Right. So that was a that was really good experience, too. And what I want to do now is go back in and see if I can catch up, um, you know, and, and become active in that again. Um, do we have any questions for Jason or any comments? I was hoping that, you know, some of our veteran students would tune into this today. Now, I'm not sure who all is on here, so I don't know if they have. I can understand that sometimes um, service members just want, or veterans, they just want to disconnect. Right. They, they see the topic, they're like, oh, 
it's meaningful for me, but I need a break. Exactly. <laughs> a break from the topic. Yeah. It's my entire life. I need a little yeah. break from it. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we are. Um, it looks like we are finishing up just a little bit early. Um, might wait to hear a few more minutes for questions. I will say if um, if there's uh, anyone out there who's interested in Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation, OES, OSPF.org is our website. It's the, basically the last part of my email address right, right there. Uh, we do have, you know, the AmeriCorps process going on if they're interested in um, AmeriCorps service supporting a veteran liaison um, position. We have those available, I'm certainly not promoting it, but it, it's just for those who are interested in giving back to the community. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you. We'll just go ahead and cut this session a little bit shorter, and that's just fine. You've provided a lot of really good information to us. Um, you know, the last couple years, the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation actually were able, they were came in person to our Love Your Body event. And um, that was a good experience, you know, to have them physically there in our event with their materials and information. And maybe we can cross our fingers that maybe next year we'll be yeah. able to do that again. <laughs> Yeah, this this type of uh, information, this presentation, it would be a lot more impactful if I was doing it in person. Right. Right. I just we know virtual platforms are great, but they don't really tell the story the same way. Just the same way as an in-person conversation is not the same in comparison to a text message. Right. Like there's no emotion or anything to the text message, and That's sometimes it's misunderstood too. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. Well, if we don't have any more comments or questions, I want to thank you. And we will just go ahead and end this session. And I have the information. If, if anybody doesn't uh, get up from this presentation, I have the information uh, that I can give you to get in touch with Jason. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. You're welcome.